Hello designers, hello illustrators, hello photographers. Welcome to a special clip of Adventures in Design podcast. Over nearly the next hour, we're going to share with you a clip from Adventures in Design episode 41, featuring our new favorite friend, Gerald Tidwell of Human Tree. Gerald's going to explain to you how he has spent less than $500 copywriting his artwork and then explain to you the steps he's taken over 17 times to protect himself against copyright infringement. This is a story you're going to want to hear if you're creative because Gerald, to this date, has learned how to make more money off of people stealing his artwork than he has getting paid to produce it. And we're talking about a six-figure payday, folks. I know that's a really weird way to think about things, but sometimes the truth is a little bit ugly. So sit back and enjoy the show for the next 55 minutes as we explain to you the process that Gerald has taken. And if you like what you hear, make sure to jump over to AIDpodcast.com to learn more about Adventures in Design, or you can go to iTunes to subscribe to Adventures in Design Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this clip, and we hope you learn how to protect yourself against those that may want to steal your artwork. Good day and good design. On our last episode, we sort of got into the topic of cease and desist letters. When people use your artwork, you know, how far do you press it? How far do you go? Many of our peers just don't have the type of money to get lawyers involved and to go down that whole route. Everybody's afraid of getting into the legal system. And then we had a tip to us from one of our listeners. Angry that Blue. you were a guy. I'm sorry, what was that? Angry Blue. Yeah, Justin. Justin. Okay. You can, you can, I, you, you can, know, you I'm can a real journalist. Thing. I don't give out my sources. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying you might appreciate a, a, a shout out and a thank oh, you. Yeah. Justin, it, he has watched this happen a million times. He and I, are, he's helped me find infringements and things like that. And he told me that you guys were talking about it and that, that you guys had the same ideas that most people have, that this is just this massive thing. And it's just not, man, it is actually fucking awesome and i'm gonna help you guys know that by the end of this okay so let's 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 roll with it yeah i I can't wait to hear this short answer how many times have you found that you've been ripped off a lot of times some of them are out of the country so when it's out of the country that's a different we'll talk about that but i've had 17 cases that i filed in one in the last six years wow so let's just go with that you've had 17 cases you filed in one when somebody wrongs you, when something pops up and you go, okay, that's human tree, that was made by me, where do you go from there? What's the first thing that you do? First thing that you do is, I'll, I'll just run you through it. Say, for instance, I'm watching and I see yep. you've got a, a poster on your wall behind you. I try to find yep. out who made that poster. I go to their website or their company or their store. I buy one of every color, every size, anything I can find. I keep my receipt and then I call friends in other states and I say, hey, you mind going over to XYZ department store, see if they have this and if they do, buy one for me and um, save your receipt, send it to me, I'll pay you back. And this is what that does. This proves manufacturing, it proves the multiple SKUs of manufacturing if that's applicable. It also provides distribution information for me because the first thing someone's gonna do when you say, yo, dude, you stole my shit is they're gonna say, A, fuck you, no we didn't, we made this. And then once you prove otherwise, they're gonna say, oh, well we only made some samples and you happen to get one of the samples. And then you can say, oh, well that's funny because my boy over in in, uh, Portland got one, my boy in Orlando got me one, then my guy over here in Detroit got me one. So, you know, party foul. So they're always going, it's gonna feel personal. As soon as you, and I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but the company's responses are, always going to feel personal. They're going to tell you that you are a thief. They're going to sue you for, for like, for lying. I mean, it's, it's just, they're that, trying to big dick you. They're yes, trying to intimidate you to, to yeah. walk away. And what they don't know is I already have my little two inch dick on the table. holding it. <laughs> <down>. <laughs> what you a know? callback. Yeah. So, so let's, let's start from the beginning. You have no way to start a copyright infringement case unless your art is actually copyrighted, legally copyrighted with the Library of Congress, the whole deal, file a paper, get a certificate, all this poor man's copyright, mail it to yourself. Hey, I put, it was in this magazine, all that, it's all bullshit. It's all important, but without an actual copyright certificate, 
it is bullshit and you're starting from below zero. So stop right there. Yes. Stop right there. Yeah. Easier said than done because you've done this before and, and 99% of the people listening haven't. What's the cost? And I mean, you don't have to go into great detail, but what's the, the, the large strokes of how to do this? I like you said, I don't have to go into great detail. There are only like four details. It's so simple. I mean, I think some of my dogs have shit copyrighted. I'm just not sure. I think they're the ones selling it to these companies. <laughs> um, but basically, if you file the, the, the thing yourself, it's going to cost you 35 bucks for a single item. Where am I going to get that kind of money? <laughs> <laughs> Remember those handies we were talking about earlier? <laughs> Screaming handies. Yeah. So, and it's going to cost you 55 bucks if you're doing something like a book. Okay, now here's, okay. here's the beauty. This is why most people don't copyright things. They think that you have to copyright every piece individually, and thinking about it from that perspective makes it seem astronomical. Because I make more shit than a Chinese sweatshop, dude. It would cost me more to copyright everything than I'll ever make off this bullshit that I make. That's exactly what yeah. I was thinking. So a thinking. guy one time told me, he said, dude, he goes, you got it all wrong. You can copyright a volume of artwork, a thousand page books with five million pieces of art in it, for the exact same cost as copywriting one single item. Bam. And I was like, well, I was like, how does that work? And he was like, dude, he goes, it's a volume. You're copywriting a book, a volume. You have to make some of them, but it's the same price. So I I swear, dude, I immediately, like that day, I went to my studio and I started gathering shit up. And about a month later, I had a 40-page little coloring book. Mark, I'm, you might have one. This is from 14 mm -hmm. years ago or something. And yeah, yeah. by the way, I'm still getting paid like a fucking pimp off of copyright infringements from that first book. So just so you know. Wow. wow. So, and, I, and then I, I went to a lawyer because I didn't know all of this at the time. Now, a lawyer, to get it done at a lawyer's office, is going to cost you between $125 and $150 just because you got the $60 or $50 fee, let's say. And then they're going to charge right. you like $50 or $100 to do it because they're fucking greedy leech pigs. But even the lawyers I like, they know I say that to them too um, because they charge me 40% on cases and then they charge me $285 an hour for other things. But that's a whole other story. So those kinds of numbers scare the shit out of artists. But here's the reality. Spend 50 bucks, get your book copyrighted yourself, go to LegalZoom or one of these places or just print it out, do it yourself. The copyright office has their own web stuff now. Then you have this copyright. You may never need it. But when it pops up, you've got it. So now, and, and it, it varies from state to state. Copyright law is federal, but there are some variations between states. If you have it copyrighted, I'm going to give you both scenarios. If you have it copyrighted and I find this thing, I can sue them for, you know, for damages, for property. I mean, for um, profits, all this sort of stuff. It makes the case, let's just say that makes it a $20,000 case, just for instance. Now, if I had not copyrighted it and I find this art, I can file my copyright at that point. But since I have legally copyrighted it after finding the infringement, there's no, and I hope I'm saying this right, there's no, you can't sue for damages because they haven't actually right. damaged your right to be able to right. sell that. So damages are basically like if I say, hey, they beat me to market with my own thing, and I copyrighted this before they did this. I intended to get to market. They beat me, and they took my chance to make money. So then you can sue them for that sort of thing. Now, my first case started off of something I copyrighted after I found the infringement. Um, so it was still fine. Like, for instance, if you do it that way, you may get ten or $12,000 instead of twenty or $30,000. But the costs are the same. The only thing you're going to pay different at that point is you lose money because you're behind them and you've got to pay a right. lawyer to try to get this push through the system. So you're going to end up spending a few hundred bucks there. Um, but it's so easy and I don't understand why people don't know this. It, I, I, I guess I got lucky to find out this information. So basically that's why I now have um, eight art books that I've created. Um, with other publishers, self-publishing, that sort of thing, that are all copyrighted. So up until like six or seven months ago, everything that I've done basically is copyrighted. Every year I'm copywriting hundreds of images in these little stupid books, like little zines and stuff that I'm making. I think you only have to make 
a dozen copies or maybe it's a hundred copies. I don't remember. It doesn't affect me because I make more, but I know there's yeah. a minimum and it's very little. You send off two copies. They, sto- they, they use one for their, for their active library, I, 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 from what I understand, where they can go back and check things and follow up on names if other people are trying to register something. And then one that's a permanent collection in, the, in their archive. So that way, it also proves another thing, that you've made more than one copy. So, right, right. Okay, sorry about being long-winded. I hope that gets no, us No, started. no, 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 no. no, no. Dude, this I mean, is so at the end of every year, if I just took everything I did in 2014 and put it, put it in a book and got it printed at, at wherever. Kinko's. Yeah, yeah, anywhere. Anywhere. And then just every year, just made a book and then copyrighted that book, in which included everything I did for that year. And I'd be then I, everything I've done would be copyrighted. Absolutely, it's that fucking simple, dude. <laughs> Bill, you should do that every January, but I'm going to do it every December, so I will copyright <laughs> you before you do every year. Uh, dude, Justin, Justin, and I joke about selling each other's art to companies as designs, and so that we can sue. <laughs> <them. laughs> oh shit! Oh, that's the best scam. Don't do that, dude. You get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, wait, you, so okay. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, uh, so what is your, you know, before you make any money back, what is your out-of-pocket cost for the lawyers and any kind of law fees? Like what are you, what are you paying out of your pocket before you get anything back? Are you talking about fighting or yeah. just doing this annual thing? No, 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 the fighting. I mean the annual thing, I'm assuming you could do it as DIY as you need and just like you, like you said, like you're making a zine. It could be a black and white, you know. Uh, yeah, yes. photocopy of everything that. Before you made. we get there, real quick, because yeah. I get what James is going with. But before we get there, so we don't lose any of the data, because I know everybody's sitting at home really trying to pay attention to yeah. this. So now we've been through the every year you take all your work, you gather it in a book, you publish it, you you have copyrights for all that. Now that we're all on that page, walk us through what happens when you see an infringement, and then we'll get to how much it costs at the end. Well, just real quick, whenever you do submit a, an application for a copyright on an item, um. You know, you just need basic information like the date of creation, um, first publication, and that now has grown to include like Facebook. So if it's published in a magazine or if it's you put it up on Facebook, since files are generally, basically I name my files. Like I'll name like drawing of Mark's penis slash FB. So I know that that one is the one I put up on Facebook so I can search my database. If, say for instance, I'd find that penis drawing on a bathroom wall illegally. I will then go back on my files and I'll just type in command F, FB, you know, and then I know that everything that pops up was the first day I did it. Then you just look at file information. You've got the day you created it and put it up on Facebook. So that would technically usually be considered the date of first publishing because you put it out there. And by publishing, it means when was the general public first have access to this piece of artwork? Because just creating it, it's locked away in a sketchbook. No one's had access to it yet, except for Justin, who comes over and steals them. Um, <laughs> but other than that, so that's what that means. So we had talked, Billy, we had talked about it being in a magazine, and yeah. did that count? You know, that's simply the first date of publication if you didn't put it somewhere else before. So you're going to need, like, basically your name, your date of birth, when you created the artwork. Um, uh, I believe they actually require your social security number. Um, what if I, I don't forget. have one of those? Um, <laughs> well... Then I'm calling the, the border control right now. <laughs> um, so it's really like, so here's the deal. There's no magical information. It's super basic. Just be fucking organized and don't throw your sketches in the trash so you can find them again and look at the date you created it. Sign and date your work, even if it's just for your own archival purposes so that way you can go back and refer to these things. Um, dude, when I was seven years old, my, my drawings had my full name and the full date on them. I've just always been obsessed, which is great. So now let's get to the, the, the question at hand about fighting. I find a case. I do not blow them up on social media because what that does is think about if you have a machine that's printing out dollar bills for you. Would you go and unplug it? Right. No. Oh, because yeah. what happens Billy, is— Billy, we've done everything wrong. I know. We did everything wrong. I we should apologize that. to that guy. Yeah. So, so what happens is this. You, you allow them to keep selling it. You buy as many copies as you can find from different sources. Buy one from Amazon. Buy one from Walmart.com. Buy one from, you know, Joe's 
crabshack.com, buy one from martbricky.com because he's going to be selling all this shit soon. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and then keep all of your receipts, take all of those items along with your legal copyright registration to a lawyer. Now, that lawyer is probably going to be most lawyers that do intellectual property know that they work on a contingency fee, meaning that you don't pay them. They get paid 40%, basically, that's a good general cost, of everything they recover, which is incentive to them. Because if they recover 1,000, they get 400. If they recover 100,000, they get 40 grand. So it's an incentive for them. And any lawyer you go to that, if you have all of your, your stuff legally copyrighted and you have you know, you have follow-up, you have information, you've saved them a lot of footwork. If they don't take it and they want you to have fees, they're bullshit. And my lawyers will tell you the same thing. They'll be like, no way, dude. When you come to me with a copyright case and you've got physical samples, a real copyright certificate, I look at that as like, that's an ATM. And I get to, de- free money. I get to decide how much that's worth by how much yeah. work I want to put into it. Now, you will have a few silly things. Now, I'm going to tell you guys what they... Before you get into the silly fees, do you have a return lawyer that you go to every time? I have several, yes. Several. And how do you decide who to use? Um, basically by who is being the most responsive to me. Like, for instance, I have okay. a, a lawyer. I had a call today, literally today, and he asked me, you know, we were talking, and he said, well, I know you have more cases. I said, since the last case you guys took on, I felt neglected. So I got another law firm, and there's been another, you know, X, Y, and Z digits of, of, of infringement cases that I've gotten. And now I'm starting to feel neglected by them because it's so easy. They just, they just have to send a few emails and they kind of forget about you. So I'm about to hire on my next infringement case a third intellectual property lawyer. So that way at all times I have someone who I can go and shake their tree and be like, dude, I want this to happen. You know, because wow. they're making money, dude. Like that's being in the driver's seat, man. You know, you gotta you gotta stay in control. And if a lawyer's not doing what you want, tell them to step the fuck off. You're going somewhere else because they work for you. They don't want you to think that, but they do. Right. You know. Right. Okay. Much like an agent or something like yeah. that. Like you know, at the end of the day, if somebody's getting a percentage, then that means that you're the boss. Yes. And if they're not working for that percentage, then find someone who will. Okay. So now we've established. We've picked our law team. We know that we have an infringement on our case. What's next? When you go to them, what you'll do is you'll bring them some samples of the work. Generally, I bring the lawyer two samples, one for them to keep and then one that, one for them to use, like if they need to send it somewhere, they need to have it authenticated. They need to have it as a, to send off to the company, just whatever. Usually they just keep both copies because it's no big deal, but it doesn't cost me anything more, just, you know, two samples, then they just basically take it and they'll contact the company and you're still in control. They'll contact the company and they'll send them a cease and desist letter. Then once the company responds, um, they'll, they'll communicate, you know, like time frames. like here's our cease and desist. You have 20 days to respond to this. Um, or we're going to, you know, we'll pursue legal action, you know, like file it with the courts. And then, so what happens from that point? Not to break your flow, but oh, no, no, just because not. I'm really trying to break this down for the listener at home. Let's say that they send out the cease and desist and they back down. At that point, do you owe your legal team anything? Because they, technically they stopped it, but technically they didn't make anything to get a 40% from. So how does, if it stops right there, what's the outcome? Well, here's the deal. By the time you found it, it has already been out in the world making money. Right. So That's just why because, you have your samples. Yes. Just because they stop okay, good. doesn't mean anything. They have made money off that. So if they stop that very moment, which just for the record, none of them do. They always tell you to fuck off and they wow. try to sell this shit off. Okay. Which is great because, you know, they, they want to try to clear this shit out because they don't want to have to eat it or burn it or whatever. They have money invested. You file this thing, cease and desist. Let's just say they're incredibly compliant and they say, hey, man, you're right. We did, we did accidentally steal that. And none of these companies are doing it on purpose. We'll get to that in a minute. This is a really, really important part of it, but we'll get to that. That's sort of a side note. Um, just remind me, just say lazy fucking artist, and I'll, and I'll tell you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah okay. Um, so they stop, and they say, hey, man, we're really sorry. We want to work with you guys on this. We don't want any legal action. We don't want to have to tell our shareholders that we're getting sued for an infringement. So what do you guys need? Well, then your lawyer will just demand discovery, which means cost of goods, 
manufacturing costs, how many units you manufactured, how many you wholesaled, how many you retailed, how many got returned, damages. If you took out an ad and juxtaposed to promote this new Mark Ricky Dick drawing, I'm going to keep going there, dude. I just can't help it. You're so. That's, you know, that's it. fine. I love it. You know, that's fine. You know, continuity. It's good for the listeners. It's copyright. Go ahead. Dig in a hole. So, <laughs> all of, so all of these things, then they can send you all of this. And say, for instance, you look through it and you realize, hey, okay, these guys, there was a hundred thousand dollars generated. We're going to go with round numbers. They spent forty-five grand to make that hundred thousand. So now we've got 55 grand left, which would be basically net profit. Let's just call it net profit. Right. As the person suing them, you can, in, a, in the real world, I mean, people say, oh, you can sue them for all of that and then you take their profits and make, you know, it's not really true. The reality is generally if they're compliant, you, you allow them to keep their costs. You don't, I mean, you can't take their costs. They spent that already. You allow them right. to, to do that. And then what I generally do is say this. Okay, if you're being super nice guy, this is the letter you get from, from my lawyer. Mr. Tidwell has decided to make this offer to you. The profits are $55,000 by our account. He will take 60% of that and you can sell off the remaining goods that you have out in stores. You don't have to recall them or anything. And then at the end of that, he, you can offer a licensing deal to them. Now, I'm really nice. Like if you were getting sued by someone, my initial contact with you is super duper nice. And that's because it's easier to get a $20,000 check in three months and without any hassle than having to fight for a year and a half to get $25,000. You know what I mean? Right, right. So the first contact for me is always really, really nice. Like, hey, I'll, I'll split the profits with you. So you can keep half your profits, dude. You're just basically discounting your, your thing. And then you can sell off. We'll talk about if you would like to license this piece of artwork for future manufacturing. But you can no longer manufacture. You can no longer distribute. If it's in your warehouse, you have to shut it down. Out of 17 cases, three p people said absolutely no problem. Where do we send a check? We're really sorry. We'd like to do that. Three out of 17 so 14 yeah. people sent me back a fuck you letter. Wow. And so now guess what happens when you send Gerald a fuck you letter? <laughs> the next correspondence you get from me is that I have filed a case in federal court. I'm now demanding damages. I'm demanding 100% of your profits. I'm demanding detailed discovery. I want, to, I want every fucking thing. And because I'm filing the case in, in the state of Kentucky, you are now required to get legal representation in my state. So that ah. means you can't just send your fancy schmancy, you know, big time department store right. lawyer. You have to come to, to Louisville. You got to come and hillbilly it out with me. You, you gotta, <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And you've got to hire a, a Louisville licensed in the Western District of Kentucky lawyer to represent you. And there's only one, and you <laughs> he works for you, so it's a total scam. You got it all figured out. So, so now they're going to have to pay you more money. Now they have to share it with their shareholders. They have to do all of this stuff. They have to pay for their own lawyer fees. Now they're going to be paying for my lawyer fees on top of that, if there are any, outside right. of the, the fees. So they don't want to do that. So once they get this lawyer, they generally become much more compliant. But at that point, it's too late. Now we're in... We're, we're for real. And here's the beauty. If Mark is manufacturing a product and he's distributing it to, let's say, all the big box stores, say you've got a perfect product and you're distributing it to all the majors, you know, the, the Walmarts, right. Kmart, Sears, all this, this stuff, right? Now I'm going to name all of those people in the suit and I'm going to send them. I, I do this anyway. Sorry. I should have said this before. I'm going to send out my initial letter to everyone that's selling it because they all have to stop, right? Well, oh. if you're not compliant, well, then I, I name all of those companies in my federal suit when I oh file my, my suit with the court. So guess what? Mark, all of these big companies are going to be calling Mark saying, listen up, fucker. You've gotten us involved in a lawsuit because of your bullshit. Get us out of this now. Wow. And so that makes Mark want to make me a check real fast. 
And sometimes yeah. these big companies, um, I can't I can't say particular ones, but one of the really largest um, big box stores in the world. It's in every freaking mall on planet Earth, probably. Rhymes with Smarget. No, 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 no. <laughs> even even older than Smarget. Um, they were in slay, a slay heart. <laughs> they were in a case, and the guy that the guy manufacturing the, the stuff was not responding to them in a timely manner. So they wrote our, my lawyer and said, "Hey, can we just pay you guys what profits we made, one hundred percent of them, and just get us off this case?" And of course, we were wow. like, "Well, sure." I mean, we're not trying to sue you. We named you because we need to know your profits, and we need you to put pressure on this jackoff who's making the, the goods. Wow. So. It's a big thing, but guess what I do? I simply answer a couple of emails to my lawyer. Now, lawyers are handling all this shit. Yeah, I answer right. a couple of emails, answer a couple of calls, go sign a couple of documents, and just be patient, and eventually a check comes. Do you ever have to actually go to court and show up and wear a suit and you know be uh, cross-examined and all that shit? <laughs> the two times— Mr. Tidwell, can you prove to me this was your tree? <laughs> <laughs> well, well long, long before court— you're going to have um, uh, mediation stuff where you're going to go and meet the two. If it gets this far along, this is when big money gets on the table. Yeah, you're going right. to go with the, your lawyer, and they're going to send their representation and their lawyer. You're going to go in a room. It's going to be documented video, audio, with a court reporter doing all this stuff. And, and everyone tries to hash it out there before you take up the court's time. And it's already filed with the court, but this is like a pre-step. Like if you guys can't get this shit sorted, we'll go ahead and try the case. Well, the two times that I had to get there, it got resolved. The third time that it, we kind of, I don't even remember how this happened, but we kind of skipped over a lot of that because these people were being really non-compliant, and we ended up sitting in court. We were sitting in the courtroom waiting. We had like two hours or something like that waiting, if, of waiting because you just have to go early. You know, you don't just show up on time, whatever. Right. And a, a runner comes in with a document for me to sign and finds us in the courtroom and they bail right then because they were like, fuck it. They, they, they pulled our bluff and so they had us sign it right there and we got up and walked out of the courtroom. Wow. These people, wow. When you're in court, do you do your own courtroom drawings? <laughs> <laughs> I should, dude. I would draw myself all buff and like all looking good and stuff, you know? And if so, do you copyright that? And if so, has that ever been bootlegged? And if so, did that go to court? Because now this is a real MC Escher piece of artwork we have on our hands. <laughs> so people don't want to be sued. Companies don't. And here's why. Because then they have to answer to people. If it's a small screen print shop and they're making, you know, they made 50 copies you're probably not going to get anything. They're probably going to send you a box of those T-shirts and tell you to fuck off. You know, there's different levels of this. But if you're suing someone in a big, in a big co company that has a, a large-scale distribution and that sort of thing, they don't want to be sued because then they have to tell their shareholders that they made a boo-boo. And they don't want to do that because shareholders are who pay for their shit. So no one really wants to – if you know your buddy's about to tell your parents – you might let him get to your front door, but if he gets there and grabs that hand, you'll be like, no, 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 no. Okay, you can have my bicycle, dude. I don't care. I, I tried right. to bluff you. I called you a dickhole. I threatened to beat you up, but now I know you're not bullshitting. Okay, we're going to comply. It's awesome, dude. And it's actually a really great thing because I know this sounds weird to think of it from this perspective because 99% of the time when you tell someone, oh, yeah, someone stole my copyright infringement. I mean, stole my, my art and they're, they infringed. They're like, oh, man, that sucks. Fuck those people, man. That's terrible. I want you to look at it from my perspective and from your perspective as a fellow artist who's about to be copywriting the shit out of everything. If you license a piece of art from me, you know, you, you might be into me for a couple grand, right? Like, you know, right. and that's going to be very regimented. You're going to have like a single item license. You can do small, medium, large, extra large. You have 12 months of, of rights to that piece of artwork. Right. And then we're going to renegotiate. It's going to cost you a couple grand. I don't mind that. I like making a couple of grand as much as the next guy. But if you steal that piece of art, we're automatically talking like 10 times that. Because yeah. think about this. This is the analogy that I tell people. If you go into Target, I love Target. So if you're listening, sponsor me because I love you guys. <laughs> um, I want to do a line of dish towels. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Mark. I just infringed on you. I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, uh, um, if you go into Target and you steal a $10 item, you go out to your car, you get in your car, you're driving off, a cop pulls you over and says, hey, they just told me you stole this. You don't get to hand them a $10 bill and keep the item. 
You also right. don't get to just return the item and say, oh, my bad. You don't even get to give them the item back and the $10. You not only have to do that, your ass is going to jail. You're going to be in all kinds of shit. Right. So really, if you look at it from that same point of view for intellectual property, when someone steals it, it becomes a much, much larger thing than it was before. And the first question almost everyone asks is, well, can we just pay you the licensing fee that you would have normally charged? And I'm just like, right. you don't get to pay after you've taken. And I've had people say, well, do you eat at a restaurant before you pay for it? And I'm like, that's a terrible analogy, but no, you still don't get to do yeah. it. Yeah. You know? But when your girlfriend comes to you and says she's pregnant, if you put a condom on right then and there, it doesn't fix the problem. Right. So that's, <laughs> you know, that's where they're at. Yeah. They already it's, had the baby. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. It's, and it's so easy, man. People get this idea that lawyers, you're going to have to spend thousands of dollars and all this stuff. And if a lawyer looks at your case and they see no value, if they try to charge you like, OK, I'll take this case. It's going to cost you this much an hour. Then they don't see the value and they're just trying to be a dick and take money from you. If they look at the case and you have a legitimate case, they're going to want it because they know that they get to determine how much they get by how much energy they want to put in. And also what bodes well for you is that you're very organized. You have your shit together. So when you come to them, it's like a dream client. It's like you're handing them free right, money. Right. They, my lawyers literally say to me, you are a dream client because I come to them with yes. samples, with all of my documentation. This is the day I created it. Here's a copy of the sketch. Here's a copy of the ink. Here's the color version that I manufactured in my screen print shop. Here's the day. And when I you say copy, you're, you're talking like actual photocopy of your... Like my pencil. Stuff. Like I just print out a whatever, or take them a drawing and a copy of the sketchbook yeah. page. That can, like the physicals, okay. you know, like the yeah, things yeah. where I made it, you know. But you don't have and, to give them the actual fucking sketchbook. Oh, no, no, not at all. Yeah, you yeah, just yeah. take them like a, yeah. in, you know. Oh, speaking of copies, here's, here's a trick. Now, this happened to me on my first two cases, and I'm giggling because it's fucking ridiculous. But, hey, it's the truth. When you get a, con when you get a fee, I mean a lawyer, and they're working on this fee, like where they get a percentage – they're going to have the right to charge you for like clerical things. Like for instance, when they have to mail a letter to these people, you know, they're going to charge you like the mail fees. They're going to charge you for copies. They're going to charge you for um, the runner. If it's, if they have to take something over to court, you know, so you'll have some right. nominal fees, 50, hundred dollars here and there. Well, my, Cost of business. yeah, just normal little things. Like these are things that like they're not doing. They're sending a kid an intern, a nickel and dime. Yeah. Little stuff. On one of my larger cases, now this was a six-figure case, in my stuff, and I still have it, I had $280 worth of copies. <laughs> and so I, from that day on, I said, for every lawyer, I say, I am paperless. I don't need physical copies of anything except for documents where I had to sign. Right. I need the copies of my actual certificates, things like that, and copies of checks and, of course, things like that. But I don't need to have every email you sent printed out as a copy because right. you can just forward me on the emails. And they know that, but it's just the way they do it to keep these interns and stuff in business. So if you do a case, just ask the lawyer like, hey, I don't need copies of everything unless it's something that's important, like a decision document, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and that's why you're a true businessman, because... You said it was a six-figure deal, and you complained about three hundred dollars in photocopies, and that allows me to know that you are a oh, fucking that's good great, businessman. Oh, that's great, though. That's great. So going, every dollar counts. Going back to it's it's free money. You might as well get all of it. <laughs> yeah. So going back to the question that I had at the beginning, it sounds like there is no out-of-pocket cost essentially besides these little odds and ends, because what you said was you only the lawyers only get paid on how the case is determined. So if somehow they fuck up and the, you lose the case, you, you don't have to pay them any money. Is, is, is that generally correct? Yes. In, in, okay. in general terms, yes. You'll have a few fees here and there. And, yeah. and, and most lawyers will try to figure out a way to get a little money. They'll say, oh, I have to do some copyright research, so it's going to be $100 for, you know, for my paralegal, I think that's what they're right. called, the person who helps them, their assistant or whatever. Right. But, you know, it's it's not much money. It's paralegal if you can't use your legs. Quadriplegic <laughs> <laughs> if you can't neck down. Oh, can I, I, can I just take a pause real fast here? Yeah. Sure. And say yeah. that in 41 episodes of the show now, this was like probably the most important half hour 
on the show that we've agree, ever fucking done. 100%. And Gerald, from me and all the guys here at AID and all of our thousands of listeners, thank you, thank you, thank you. It was awesome. Amazing. Truly a hero. Really. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. That was unbelievable. I really, really appreciate that. I have no secrets. And I can't believe that so many people struggle with the idea that this is above them or it's bigger than them or they would be crushed by it because it's just not the case. And I yeah. hate when I hear of someone who's been ripped off and ripped off and ripped off and they just say, oh, uh, what can I do, dude? They're a big company. And I'm like, get your head out of your ass, man. Look, just type it into Google. Like, you can find this shit, you know? I had to find it the, the hard way. You know, it's so easy to find this information, but there's so much looming presence of like, oh, lawyers, they're gonna just suck all your money. And it's just not the case, man. People wanna make money. And these lawyers, they look at a case and they're like, fuck, this kid just handed me everything I need. All I've gotta do is write a couple of dirty emails and I might make right. 50 grand. I right. love this kid, man. Right. You know? Yeah. Daddy needs a new Audi, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you this. You said, remind me talking about uh, oh, yeah, a right. bad artist or, or, or lazy artist. Lazy, lazy artist. Okay. Do we cover that? No, 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 no. No. The way this happens okay. is just for instance, say a big box store has a whole rack of your stuff. They didn't steal that shit. Some, some guy, like for instance, we've all worked for probably these merchandising companies, and they'll send out, excuse me, they'll send out a cattle call to like their 10 go-to guys. They'll be like, right. hey, Gerald, Justin, Mark, Billy, uh, James, all you guys, we need some skulls for a t-shirt line we want to sell to a y X, Y, Z. You're like, cool. So say the four of us, we fucking dig in and draw our stuff. I'm gonna do this, watch this, watch what I'm about to do. We do our stuff and Justin, a little lazy ass. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucking Justin. He comes over to the studio and fucking steals one of my drawings, and then he submits it as his. Well, this company is none the wiser. And we all know, right. people like to think, oh, it's contracts and everyone's legally binding. I've never gotten a fucking contract from anybody, and I've worked for all the majors. You know, I've gotten a right. contract for album art, because that's a big deal. They're selling, you know, millions of units. This is important. Right. They need the image to use for merchandising. That's different. So now they do this cattle call and they go, dude, Justin, this one is fucking awesome. A master, amazing artist must have drawn this one. <laughs> Which we all know obviously wasn't Justin. Dude, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I, oh, man. Because, because I know he's going to hear this and he's going to walk over and just punch me right in the throat. <laughs> um, so they, they buy it from Justin. They give him 500 bucks. You know what? That's because it wasn't because Justin isn't a good artist. He's a better artist than me. He just, you know, he could be a better artist than me, whoever this person is. They just got lazy. They didn't have time, right. and they thought, here's a quick couple hundred bucks. They were never going to print it anyway. Why would they pick my skull over all these other guys? But I'll get a little kill fee of a couple hundred bucks for submitting. Or at the other hand side of things, they thought, I can take this image I found on Google Image Search. I can live trace it. I can rotate it 90 degrees. I can put a distressed, like, you know, old English eye on the forehead, and now it's mine. And it's not. It is so not. continue. Well, continue. just to touch on that, there was this thing that I was told when I was first getting started that like, well, dude, it's changed 25%. I can do that. Well, that is completely a myth. And guess who gets to decide how close it is? Me, my lawyer, and my judge that I go visit. Not nice. you. Okay. Not the guy who fucking ripped it off. You don't get to tell me it's 25% difference. The judge and my lawyer and I get to decide how close it is. And I would say I'm a little biased. You know? I would hope so. So you can flip it, fucking smack it, rub it down. Oh, no, Bell Bill DeVoe that shit. <laughs> and if I fucking see it, I'm going to yes. fucking get you. So now getting back to the thing. So really, so-and-so merchandising company, you know, they should have really checked their shit and made a contract with this artist. They probably didn't. So shame on the artist, but the, now all of the, the, the burden falls on the merchandising company because they're the ones who manufactured and distributed this particular item. They bought a bad design. They, they bought a limit. Yeah, they bought right. a bad design. And so now all these big box stores have been selling the shit out of this thing, and then they, they all get a letter that says, hey, guys, you stole this. Now, not only are they all pissed because they got duped, but now they want to defend their point of view, and they're going to say, we didn't fucking do this. We bought it from Fred. 
or wait, Justin. We're going back to Justin. We <laughs> bought it from Justin. It's my dick, and Justin's the yeah. skull still. So they're 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 going to say we bought it from Justin. That's his problem. Well, he has his own set of problems now, but primarily you're the one who made the profit off of it. He simply sold you a bogus design. You manufactured and distributed and sold and profited from this thing. So you are the sole responsibility holder for all profits, right. all manufactured goods that were created using this art. Now, am I going to walk one house over and punch Justin in the head? Hell no, I'm taking him out to lunch, dude, because he just got me paid. But I'm not <laughs> going to say that out loud, though, you know. But no, the reality is we'll call, we'll send up lawyers, we'll send letters to these artists and be like, hey, you know, fucker, please steal more of my designs. No. <laughs> we're, like, we're like, you know, you, have, you can't do this. You can't distribute this thing. And then, of course, they're going to give you some sob story. Be like, I told them that that wasn't mine. It was just an inspiration to give them an idea. It's a bunch of people passing the blame. Period on the end of the sentences. The person who manufactured, distributed, and sold the goods is the person responsible to fucking pay me. Let me ask you this. You saw what the piece of art that kind of got ripped off yes. from me. If I wouldn't have done everything wrong, <laughs> if I, if I would have had it copyrighted, <laughs> if I wouldn't have um, gone to Twitter with it because I didn't think I, you know, because I thought lawyers were too much and it was too big of a case and I didn't want to deal with that bullshit. Now you you saw you saw the picture the side by side. Do you think if I wouldn't have done everything wrong that I would have had a case? Oh, absolutely. And the opposite, I mean the opposite. The other side of that is that you probably still have a case. You yeah. just don't have nearly as good of a case. Let's say your other case was a 10 like Bo Derek running on the beach, beads in the hair. <laughs> well, you're going to get a Janine Garofalo, which is probably better in the sack, but not as valuable commercially. <laughs> You know what I mean? Okay. Like, yeah. so you still have Janine. I'm sorry, baby. I love you, but you know, come on. I was an '80s kid. Anyway, so <laughs> um, you still could have a case. What you could do at this point is file for copyright. It's yeah. going to take, and just so everyone knows, when you file a copyright request or you know whatever, dude, it takes a long time. I mean, like minimum probably six to ten months before you ever get a certificate, sometimes as much as a year and a half. Um, I know they've sped it up now because you can submit your initial forms digitally, like over the internet, whatever, and then right. you have to send them physical samples to sort of uh, prove it, solidify it and prove it, yeah. you know, physical proof. But you can fill out your paperwork actually online and pay online from what I understand now. I still don't do it myself. Just not that because I'm like Mr. Big Ship, just because I'm kind of dumb and I would fuck something up. Like I would fill out the wrong thing and it would it somehow bite me in the ass going to court. So for the extra 50 or 100 bucks, dude, it's so worth it because I just got 50 pieces of art copyrighted for 150 bucks. And I know that lawyer is now responsible for it. I'm not because so I'm too dumb. Is the copyright not valid until you get it back or is there validity from when you send it in, but it doesn't go through the system until you get it back? Good question. Um, basically, it's not valid until it's been completely issued a certificate with a number. Okay. But okay. now they're doing a thing where they do like a – and I don't remember what it's called. I've only – there's only had this happen once um, because we were trying to push one through. Um, and basically they send you like a reference number so mm -hmm. that, that you can at least file your paperwork. You can't go through with the case, but at least you can get your – start getting all your ducks in a row getting right. the, all of your legal documents from the court that you have to fill out in order to file this case. Now, I'll give you a, a, an example on something really interesting. I had a case. Yeah, please do, because so far this has been really boring. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so now, Billy, this is something that you want to know. This is why it's important to, to go cloak and dagger and not go all fucking social media, fucking crazy kamikaze assassin on people. I found an infringement case, and the sort of winterish, heading into spring. Let's just call it January. I was turned on to an infringement case and it was summer products. I won't even say the products. Um, it was fucking beach products, dude. Now, oh. on, the, on the things, if you look really carefully, you can usually find manufacturing dates on things or at least something that kind of gives you an idea when it's manufactured. So I looked and I was able to see that they were mainly manufactured a couple of months before in like October through December. So I knew that meant these, this company was gearing up for summer and it would be distributed in the spring 
sold out through the summer. And then in the fall, they would probably look at the numbers and remake them again in the winter, getting ready for the next year, right? right. right. So look at- Oh my God, I love where this is so going. So what I did is I went and I, I filed my initial paperwork in January when I found out about the case. And, wow. and then I put a hold on it until October. So that way I gave them a chance to sell the fuck out of this thing. And all summer I would call friends in different beach communities and that were going on vacation, everyone. Dude, my lawyer that was working on it took his kids on vacation to Orlando, Florida and bought two of them at a store we didn't awesome. even know was distributing. He was standing in line and one of his kids goes, Daddy, that's Uncle Gerald's. And he was like, holy shit, dude. So, <laughs> so basically what would have happened if I filed it in January? You guys already know, deductive reasoning, very simple. I would have filed it. They would have pulled all these goods. They would have never sold them. I wouldn't have gotten right. shit. And they would have just burned all this stuff. Or I would have an entire driveway full of beach products. And I'm in right. Kentucky. So by doing that, I looked at it, like Mark said, as a businessman. I was like, okay, if I know they're about to launch this thing to the moon, I'm going to wait till they get to the moon to say, uh-uh, motherfuckers, that was my rocket. Because then they can't yeah. get back without it, you know? So I allowed them to sell through. And this thing that would have turned into just some paperwork, you know, a couple hundred dollars of the lawyer fees, and possibly, I might have gotten a few hundred bucks, let's just say, turned into a really nice thing that took my wife and I on a nice um, European vacation, <laughs> minus Chevy Chase. You know, and Beautiful. it's like, simply because I had the foresight to go, you know what? Let me stop and just think for just a second. Like, for instance, I have a case right now that's going, and I filed the copyright in a book, and the book, I haven't gotten the copyright certificate back yet. So I sent it over to my lawyer, and she said, okay, cool, let me check. The certificate hasn't been issued yet. So looks like we're going to get to sit on this and let these guys make a little more profit before we file yeah. our case. <laughs> it's a business, man. Or as Jay-Z Boy, says, it's not, I'm not a businessman. I'm a business, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I am a business and, and I really look at it that way and I'm not an emotional artist like I it's things I do I am a manufacturer of things and my thing happens to be drawings so I'm not all emotionally charged and all broke dick over something when someone insults it or steals it or something to me that's just another step in the business of whatever I created paying me back you know I'm reaping the benefits of what I've been growing Gerald, have, could you say right now that the most money you've ever made as an artist is from people stealing your stuff and not hiring you to create? Dude, that's so easy. There were five years in a row I made more from infringement cases than I did as an artist. And I had to come to the realization that either I needed to get better at art because they were stealing shit from like 10 years before, or I might have to stop because without infringement cases, I wasn't making a real living as an artist for like four or five years in a row. It was like a dry time, but just happened to be a good time for being stolen. Shit. You know? Wow. So I have made the single largest payday I've ever had from anything to do with art was an infringement case. And here's the beauty of that. This is so awesome. Justin and I go to the malls a couple times a year, and we call it fishing. We go looking for infringements. We just go look. When they release the stuff for school, when they release all the summer merchandise, yeah. when they release the back-to-school merchandise, we go look for graphic tees and stuff and phone cases and whatever the fuck else, underwear. So we walk into a giant retailer. Actually, I think it's the first big box retailer ever created, if I know correctly, if I remember correctly. And we walk in and there's a rack and it's in the department. It's all squared off, right? We walk into a rack. I walk to the right side. Justin walks to the left side. And we're sitting there. We're flipping through racks of like all these terrible fucking skull graphic shirts. And I, and I hear Justin go, fuck, dude. And I like looked up at him and he's just staring at me with this look on his face like, I fucking hate you and I love you. And I'm like, what? He just, he just raises his hand and points behind me. And I turn around and there's an entire wall, like eight items hanging, eight, eight items wow. hanging on the wall of, of the same design of my art. And I just looked at him and I was like, we about to get paid, baby. Oh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> And then so then once we saw that, then we went to all the other retailers that were in the mall and we went to some out, external big box stores and they almost all had a version of the same thing from the same company printed on different types of merchandise. So it was like specific to their market. Like one company had all blue and black and the next company had red and green ones. One company had this particular style. One. And so we had ended up with like nine SKUs from three different retailers 
that were massive. And then like another two or three SKUs from like smaller sort of independent or lower tier retailers. Wow. Unbelievable. Really, it was wonderful. And that money helped Justin and I establish our Crackhead Press. It helped us publish books and things like that. And yeah. and we turn it all right back into money. Like I, I don't just take it and go and get hookers and stuff. Well, I do, but since my wife's sitting behind me, I can't say that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> you know, here's the, here's a funny scenario. Imagine Gerald and Justin, you know, I'll be nice. Holding hands. Two shady looking characters. We're holding hands. Two shady looking characters walking around a department store. <laughs> How funny is it if the security guards, like, I'm going to look at these guys. I bet they might steal something. <laughs> and if they stumble on nine fucking designs that they own that corporate America stole from them, like, how's that for life's little ironies? Well, I love it when I go to the register and I have, like, ten of the same thing. And they're like, wow, you really like this one. I'm like, I love this design. This thing is awesome. And then, I, then I say things like, do you have this, like, you haven't been doing that. You know, if you have this like in the women's department or the kids' department and stuff, and I've had clerks at counters go, you know what? I think we have this in kids. And I'm like, wow. oh, I love it. And I say, oh. I have I have a whole pile of kids. I would love to buy these for. <laughs> we don't have any kids, and so I'll go and buy one of every color, every size. Because when you say, for instance, they have it in blue and red, they have it in small, medium, and large. So that's six skews. You have two colorways, three sizes each. So that's six skews that they're now responsible for. But if you went to them with only a blue large, they would say, oh, that's the only size we make because you have right, to tell them right. you know you shit. Yeah. And we've had yeah. cases right. where they sent us back like distribution channels and they sent us information. We didn't even know that they had it in other stores. So we're like, holy wow. shit. So we just went and bought one and acted like we had it, you know, because nice. they disclosed it. You know, right. <laughs> like it's like, it's kind of a game really, you know, but you just yeah. have to be willing to stand your ground and get called an asshole and get told that you stole it and get told you're going to get sued and you're full of shit. You just have to just keep saying, you know what? Fuck you. I made this. This is mine. It'll all come out in the wash. Yeah. Well, Gerald, thank you so much for, like Billy said, Seriously, you know, sharing this with everybody. I mean, this is such great information. How would you know, unless you talk to somebody like you that actually went down the road of figuring out how the fuck this works and, and how to take up for yourself. So uh, on behalf of, like Billy said earlier, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing this with us, man. Why don't yeah, they really. teach us in school? That's what I want to know. You know, they, they teach you how to make stuff, but they do, teach you nothing about business in school. Yeah. Nothing. We teach more about business than schools do. That's why I declare us the professor. <laughs> Just, Just, I was going to... Gerald, I was going to ask before, do you ever do any teaching? No, I mean, I, I have no secrets. I, just like whenever we were talking, I was like, dude, I'll tell you guys everything I know. Oh, you know? no, that's why I say, I mean, you're, I think you, the way you communicate all this stuff, I, I, I was just curious because it seems like you, you're you used to doing this. I, you know, uh, so I was wondering, do you, do you ever go to colleges and kind of, you know, give the design students any kind of heads up or anything? Or? They can't afford him. <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do that. Like, I'll go to schools yeah. and things like that for sure because nice. I think that a little bit of information is is really good, you know. And yeah. and just to, to make sure everyone knows, when you go to see lawyers, there are going to be differences. Like, each state handles things a little differently. If you're dealing with a, with a company that's importing goods from China that has your image on it, you're only really going to get any money they made. You can't really get the Chinese people or the... I'm sorry, I don't mean that to sound uh, no, no, no. whatever, but a lot of goods that are, are manufactured in China get imported, and they have they have basically pretty much, for general purposes, they have no copyright law. They can do whatever the hell they yeah. want. So yeah, if yeah. I wanted to manufacture something of Mark's, I could get an offshore company to do it. That offshore company is not responsible to me, really, unless they, they happen to honor our copyright laws. Not to cut you off, no, but no, real please, quick, this please. is sort of an interesting like thing. They have such little copyright laws in China that right now Disneyland's building a park in Shanghai, and all of the conceptual art, they won't show anybody anything that's going to be there because when they were building Disneyland in Anaheim, a guy built a bootleg Disneyland <laughs> wow. in China called Dreamland wow. that is like – Kind of like Disney on acid because they will bootleg anything. So they weren't, they're not showing anybody this park until grand opening because they know that the minute that a grand opens, everything in that park will be on sweatshirts, this, that, and the other. But to the point where somebody might build an exact replica of the park in another populated area to try to make the money. So it's fucking crazy over there. Wow. Yeah. Wild. It's, it's like I'm dealing with a case right now that they bought the art from a company in London. Now, the UK, they work with us 
you know, there's some sharing of copyright law. You know, they, they honor some of it. And, of course, it's, it's amended. They make sure that they change things that, that they have to suit for their laws. So right. it changes things. But even state by state, um, it's federal law, but it's, it's governed by states. And so some states require little different things. Like, for instance, when I did the thing in London, we actually had to file a case in the Southern District of Indiana because Indiana – a, they they um, have a little different spin on international copyright um, sort of uh, um, cooperation type stuff than we do right here in Kentucky. So we had to go 10 minutes away and pay to have it filed in that district simply because each one is going to be slightly different. So know that whenever – to the view, to the listeners, um, when you go to, to your lawyer, there will be differences. There are going to be slight differences. But the big picture is what I was really trying to address today is that – you know, well, sorry, I stated that wrong. What I was trying to address today, we're more the, the big picture, the general idea of how everything works and an easy way to make sure you protect yourself. You know, because really protecting yourself is important whether you're getting cases or not. You want to protect yourself. If you're someone who's creating yeah. original content for this planet, protect it. It costs nothing. It's a good thing to do. And just so happens it can turn into a payday if you're really lucky. And I'm the luckiest guy you guys will ever speak to, man. For oh, yeah. a million reasons, this just happens to be one tiny one. You know, it really is. Thank you for sharing that luck with with all of us and, and, and the listeners. And Yeah, we're lucky for talking about this. Wow. Can I just say that that is one of the best interviews that we've ever done on Adventures in Design. The way that Gerald perfectly painted the picture of how to protect yourself on each front, on the copyright side and on the lawsuit side, when somebody does cross you, how to build a case and how to make money and how to get what you deserve for your artwork. Isn't that such a great concept? What you deserve. <clears throat> I'm going to just chew on that for a little bit. I well, hope you enjoyed this clip from episode 41 there was a lot more we learned from Gerald in the beginning, uh, his origin story of how he came about to be, well, this redneck scholar that he is. So swing over to iTunes and listen to Adventures in Design, episode 41. Or feel free to visit AIDpodcast.com. That's our website where you can find out about all the different projects we have going on, all the different pieces of media and communication that we send out to you to strengthen the creative community. Thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed this. Good day. Good design.